So I'd like to welcome Professor uh, Emeritus Professor Harvey J.K. of uh, Wisconsin Green Bay, um, University of Wisconsin Green Bay. He's the author of The Fight for Four Freedoms, What Made FDR and the Greatest Generation Great. That's uh, truly right great, here. not just great, truly great. Truly great. <laughs> yes, it's not only great, but it's truly. Uh, but uh, author of Thomas Paine and the Promise of America, which is uh, about what we're going to be talking about today. And then also take hold of our history, which is his most recent work. Um, yeah, just so people know, rather than over, oh, yeah, over this shoulder is uh, the cover of the Thomas Paine book that we'll be sort of talking about, you know. Sweet. And then right here is the very small cover of, <laughs> of Harvey K. Postcard book. of the book, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just, we, we're going to get into Thomas Paine. There is uh, obviously a lot to cover, so we'll just get into it. Um, could you just very quickly go into where was Thomas being born? Where, what oh, was his sure. origins, his upbringing, and then how did he get to America? Yeah, that's great. Okay, so first of all, I'll just start off with one line and then as to why he matters. It was the greatest radical of a radical age, okay? And in the course of his life, he, he was the sort of, if you like, godfather of the American Revolution. It was, it was right? I mean, no Thomas Paine, no American Revolution. A colonial rebellion, sure, no American Revolution. After that, he sustained the morale of the troops during the, the revolution and of the American people to whatever extent they were committed by way of a series of pamphlets called The Crisis. After the revolution, to make the long story short right now, he went back to Europe because he was born in England, as I'll explain in a moment, and he was involved in inspiring the English, the British struggle for democracy by way of a series of writings. Most importantly, he ends up in, in France during the French Revolution and authors Rights of Man, a two, a, two, a two major pamphlet, two major pamphlets, which are an attack, the first one, an attack on British monarchy and a defense of the idea of a republic. And the second one in which he even goes beyond the idea of political democracy, and he begins to propose what we know of as social democracy, okay? And later, he, he writes in the course of the revolution, a pamphlet, again, of two parts called Age of Reason, the Age of Reason, which is, which is a critique of organized religion and the power of clergy. And finally, I mean, it wasn't the last thing he wrote, but the last major piece pamphlet he wrote was titled Agrarian Justice, which really is the first sort of vision or idea and call for what we know of as social security. And keep in mind, this is all between 1776 and the 1790s, okay? So as we talk about pain, there's so much to cover. The revolution, the British struggles, the French revolution, his ideas about not only religion, but even more radically, when you think about the struggles for democratic socialism and social democracy, his original call for what we know of as social security, or indeed the beginnings of social democracy. Now, as I said, he was born in England. He was born in 1737 in Southeast England, well, in Norfolk, which isn't fully Southeast, but it's the East, it's the Southeastern region of England. And he was born into a fairly humble family. His father was an artisan, a craftsman, um, a skilled worker, we would call them today. And his father was a Quaker, okay? Now, Quakers were not, were not full citizens, full subjects, you might say, in Britain. Catholics, Jews, diverse Protestant groups, Quakers, these folks were tolerated as religious forces. They really didn't sh have the same rights as people who were members of the Church of England. So, you know, I mean, th that, that matters in Thomas Paine's life. The, but even more curiously, um, Thomas Paine's father married an Anglican, okay, a woman, more of a middle class uh, woman, the daughter, uh, I believe, of a, of a lawyer. Um, she was just a few years older than, than his father. And they had, um, they had two children, one of whom died in, I don't know if it was in childbirth or as an infant. So Thomas Paine basically grew up um, as, as an only child. 
And his parents didn't have a lot of money. And since there were no public schools as, as we think of them, they had to spend what monies they had and secure monies from members of the family. I believe there was an aunt who was willing to help out in, in covering the tuition. So Payne did go to school, which is not usual necessarily for working class kids, obviously. And he remains in school till the age of 13. And it's notable that in school, he had certain subjects that he loved, absolutely loved science, okay? And he does eventually in, his, in the course of his life operate as something of an inventor, okay? And one of the reasons he goes back to Europe after the revolution is that he really wanted to build an iron bridge, which was very, which was a sort of, would have been a real advance in the, in the new United States to connect all the states together given rivers that flowed into the Atlantic through the colonies. And the fact that in winter, so many of these bridges would be destroyed by the ice that would form in those rivers. He wanted to build a bridge uh, of iron. And the idea was that this would then connect the country. It would be a kind of way of connecting these states so that they wouldn't fall apart in, co in competition with each other because there's no guarantee they would remain in the United States. But he loved science as a, as a boy. He also loved um, what we would think of as literature classes. He Shakespeare and Milton, the two great English writers, you know, William Shakespeare and John Milton. And he actually sort of fancied himself at many a time as something of a poet. His poetry left a lot to be desired. It's in various printed form. But what is interesting is that one of his more, more interesting songs had to do with the Liberty Tree, which was a real political statement of its day. So, I mean, it wasn't completely a waste of time that he tried his hand in that way. But at the age of 13, his parents had to pull him out of school because they just didn't have the money to keep him in school. Um, and what they did is they apprenticed him to his own father. So he would learn the craft that his father uh, made his livelihood. The craft, I haven't mentioned it yet, was corset making, which was, you know, the women's undergarments, the things that would hold them together with the proper, in quotes, shape. There's also called stay making. And that would come in handy, and I'll explain in a moment when we get to it. And he remained, he remained an apprentice to his father for several years. He didn't like it. It's a tough, very, very tough craft. And also it didn't pay a lot for his, fa his father didn't make a terribly good income. So something of a strain in the family that this would have to cover two, two, the two men, young men, the two young men and the father. But th there were certain, there was a real value in the whole experience. One, because he did learn a craft. The second thing was, is that his father would relate to him the stories of the origins of the, of the what was called the Society of Friends, which is the more formal name for those whom we call Quakers. And in the 17th century, England had had its own revolution where they overthrew the king for, for a, cu a couple of dec a few decades. And in the course of that, religion itself, because no longer did you have, the Anglican church no longer had a monopoly on religion. And those who had been involved in overthrowing the king were Puritans, that which really was a dissenting group against the, the Anglican church, the Church of England. And in the course of those years, many, uh, a Protestant group emerged, radical Protestant groups that preached radical ideas and um, the Quakers were among them. And so his father would relate the stories of the English Revolution. His father had not been alive during the revolution at all, but it was the case that this was something that any good, any good Quaker, any, any good friend, capital F friend would know. So Payne as a boy is already hearing stories of dissent and rebellion and revolution. And that surely played into his own view of the world. The, at the same time, his mother, as a, who was an Anglican, was insistent that he learn the Bible, literally learn the Bible by heart in many ways. So he had this sort of Quaker ideas about self, you know, how would you put it, kind of dissent, and also that each person, you know, in some ways has a light within them. And then he also learns this sort of more hierarchical version of, of the Christian faith in, of Anglicanism. And in part that played into uh, to his literary abilities later that he would learn the Bible. But the other thing was the stress between the father and his, his father and his mother over questions of religion must surely have also impressed upon Payne the importance of seeing beyond 
these these conflicts of religion and also the imperative of freedom of religion and free thinking. So anyhow, in around the time Payne Reach, I think it would have been like at age of 19, he runs away. He just says he's had enough. And he runs away and he signs up to serve on board a privateer. And a privateer is a ship, a private ship that's been licensed by the crown to go out and attack enemy shipping. So you can either call it a kind of sort of, it's like a, a, an official piracy, a legalized piracy in some ways. And what happens then is that the, if, if they win the fight against the, 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 the other ship, they lay claim to the ship and its cargo. And when it's brought to an English port, the, the value of it is divided up between the captain and the crew, and then the, the crown keeps the ship itself. And he spends sort of a year sounds on like board. an early, this sort of, sorry to interrupt, but this sort of sounds like an early version of like private military or like, like well, military I mean, oh, contract. Well, they weren't mercenaries. It was act to be a privateer still had an, a, an ele a real element of patriotism. So, for example, it, we don't know, I mean, to what extent it, was, it would have been a mix of patriotism and a desire for adventure for a young man or a boy, and last but not least, doing so and putting money in your pocket, if you lived, because you could easily have been killed, I mean, but pain lived. And on board ship, he no doubt was of real value because in the, the art of stay making, corset making, equipped him to also be a mender of sails on the, on, the, on the ship. He also probably learned a great deal about, about solidarity of the crew. He also would have learned a great deal or at least been afforded a real opportunity to look up at the heavens and his scientific mind would have been wondering about the nature of the universe. And also his, his mixed religious background would have led him to probably ask many a question about the nature of, of life and, and the existence of God, okay? So there's all these possibilities. Well, when he leaves ship and he does so after a year with money in his pocket and his life still completely in his, in his control, he goes to London, which at that time was the major city of the world, had a population I think, of 600,000. And he joins the artisan community of London, which is a really interesting group of, you know, of diverse skilled men and their families. Um, that had a tradition, a cultural tradition among these artisans of autodidacticism, self-education, which meant not only did they read a lot to learn about the world and also the, the, the questions of science that were emerging, but also they would organize lectures among them. They would actually literally come together at a tavern or a coffee shop in the evening and chip in monies to pay for a lecture. Might it be on geography, it might be on astronomy, it might be on medals, whatever it might be. The point was, it was a real self-education process. And it would have also raised a lot of questions, again, about politics, probably, in an indirect way, okay? The skilled artisans were not, if you, you know, many of them were far better off than the average working man, but it was still the case that in England, there was no democracy to speak of. Maybe one out of every 20 men could have the right to vote because you had to have a certain income or a certain amount of property or pay a certain amount of tax to be entitled to vote. And, and you couldn't do that unless you were a member of the Church of England. And a lot of the artisans were not necessarily Anglicans. They might've been the newly emergent Methodist group, maybe some Baptists, you know, diverse possibilities. So after about a year, Payne has sort of gone, really had a, a good experience in London, a year on board ship, a year in London, but he's running out of money. And the only skill he knows is corset making. So he leaves London, moves out to what would today perhaps be called a suburb, but he moves out of London to a, a, to a, you know, a town and village outside of London and sets himself up in a business as a, as a stay maker. And he there meets his first the first love of his life, which tragically ended up in her death in childbirth. So, which is a real, I mean, his business was tough to begin with, and then he's shattered by the tragedy of losing his wife and infant child. And the question for him now is, what is he going to do? Okay, what is he going to do? And he and his wife had discussed the possibility, since it was really tough to make a living as a stay maker at that time, that he might, because he was, he was at least literate and smart, that he might 
take the exam to become an excise officer, basically a duties, uh, you know, some, an excise officer is, is sent to the coast and the, and the port cities to inspect cargoes and, and literally uh, uh, tax the, the incoming cargo, you might say, okay, charge the tax on the cargoes. And the idea came up because her father had been an excise officer. So he goes home to his own parents' house in, in Thetford, England, and he trains or he studies to take the exam. He passes the exam and he's appointed an excise officer and he serves on the coast. And being an excise officer was not an easy thing. You had to patrol the coast, you had to inspect cargo. And a lot of villages on the coast were not very keen on excise officers as duties collectors. A lot of villages on the coast actually depended upon what they hoped to be shipwrecks, okay? That is ships that would come too close to shore and run aground or you know, run into the, into, into the rocky shoreline. And then the cargoes themselves would be liberated by the, by the natural elements. And, and the whole village would turn out to lay claim to, to you know, boxes and crates that would be flowing off the ship. And his job was basically to keep an eye out for these kinds of activities. So anyhow, Payne was accused of doing something illegal called stamping. That is, he was, there were the, it was a such a tough job that sometimes there were excise officers who didn't actually inspect the cargoes in the ports, they would just stamp them. And this way, maybe the captain of the ship or the men receiving, or the merchants receiving the cargo would pay them you know, a bit of money on the side. It was corruption. He was accused of being involved in a stamping activity, though it's funny, I say funny because a couple of weeks later, his own boss is fired apparently, which may mean that his boss was actually the guilty party and accused Payne, and Payne may have just been the fall guy in the, in the whole thing. Well, Payne is pretty determined that he's going to be reinstated, so he begins the petition process to be reinstated, but that's going to take a couple of years. I mean, it's slow moving. It might have even been as much as three years, and in the process, he's got to survive. So he moves back to London and he, he makes a living in part by teaching children of the middle class, okay, how to read and write and calculate, okay. He also does some preaching for Methodists on Sundays out in fields. Now, he doesn't get paid for doing that kind of thing, but it does provide him with a social life and with food, a good Sunday meal. And in fact, it also gave him all, all the more experience of of having to craft a powerful sentence because he's gonna give this, he's gonna give sermons at times. Well, eventually he does get reinstated and he's been living in a state of poverty. But anyhow, reinstated, he's sent to the South Coast to a town called, a village called Rye, which is a really pretty place on the South Coast. And he, he there he becomes a very, if you like, respected member of the community. Now, he doesn't have a lot of money or anything. It's not like he's a wealthy guy who wins respect because he has money. It's because he becomes a part of, because of the home in which he's living with the, the storekeeper, a man named Samuel Olive. Olive brings him into a group called the Headstrong Company, which is a group of men, artisans, and small business people who meet at the White Hart Tavern on the high street in Rye. Not Rye, sorry, in, in Lewis, L-E-W-E-S, that's the town, Lewis, I apologize. Rye is along the, a bit along the coast. I knew some people who lived in Rye. But there at the White Hart Tavern, they would eat, drink, and debate public affairs. And they would debate public affairs on everything from the American rebellion to you know the power of the crown. I mean, you name the subject they did. He also became respected because apparently he was a damn good ice skater. And on, on the streams and, and lakes nearby, he could, in fact, he was so good an ice skater, they called him the Commodore because he could move like he was captaining a ship. Um, so anyhow, he becomes well known. And also there, he starts to write a bit for the company. In other words, he, and basically it, the best debater each week got to keep the notebook for the group. And you knew who, how many times, and you knew that that Payne was a, a good man with words because he was the one who kept the book more often than anyone else. Well, here's the story. Okay, here's the story. Excise officers were very poorly paid, and the excise officers were kind of disgruntled with the state of affairs, and they decided it was time to to make to request to petition the excise commission up in London 
and if necessary, lobby parliament to get a raise for all the excise officers. And Payne had a reputation as being a man with, uh, of words, that he knew how to use words. So in a meeting, which was probably an illegal meeting to begin with, a, a gathering of excise officers chose him to be their spokesperson, that he should go to London, he should write a petition, go to London and present the petition and lobby members of parliament. And he wrote, a, a, not a pamphlet, but he wrote a, you know, a document entitled The Case of the Excise Officers. And in it, he makes a, a, a good case as to why they should raise the wages, that there's too much temptation for corruption, that, it, that here are all the expenses we, we have to accumulate or, or, or put out. And you know, given our income, it's tough to accumulate any kind of savings. And it's a really interesting little document. It's not fancy in any way, but it shows you that he can make an argument. And he goes to London and he spends quite a, quite a while there. Now, keep in mind, going to London meant probably someone had to cover for his, 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 uh, his, his what would you call it, his precinct that he was responsible his, for. His and position, his, right? His position, exactly. And what happens, of course, is it's illegal what he's doing. Right, yeah. For a start, it's illegal for any kind of what we would think of as union activity to take place. Yep. And this, in essence, is, is a labor action. That's number one. Number two, he's abandoned his post. Right. Okay? Now, and, the, and, and what happens is that in time, he's going to be fired again, or as they say in England, sacked. But along the way, he meets very prominent people in London as he's lobbying, and he's making a damn good impression on them. And one of the people whom he meets, and it, we don't know if it's the first time he meets him or the second time he meets him, but one of the men he meets is Benjamin Franklin. And by this time, Franklin is already recruiting people with the idea of they're going to, of these, these young men or middle-aged men, if they're prominent, to go to America and perhaps contribute to the American colonial rebellion. So now we're in the early 1770s, basically 1773, 74. And Franklin must see Payne's talent with words. And he, he recommends to Payne when he's fired that Payne move to, to, to America. And that is Payne's plan. So what, with what little money he has, because he's been sacked and he ha he's been, I don't even know if he's been paid for some time, he heads to America with a, with a letter of reference, of recommendation from Franklin. Again, it's not a fancy one, but it's a good paragraph making it clear that this is somebody that you should pay attention to. And he directs Payne to go to Philadelphia and show the letter around. But keep in mind that Benjamin Franklin is the most famous person in the entire Atlantic world of the 1770s and the 1780s. The guy is world renowned as, a, as something of a statesman for, the, for America and also as an inventor. So Payne goes to America and arrives in Philadelphia. He barely survives the voyage, by the way. But when he arrives in Philadelphia and after he's recovered, it's now the winter of 1774, 75. And he arrives in a country or, or you know, in the colonies and the colonies are already in rebellion. They've literally risen up Americans in the wake of the Boston Tea Party of December 73 and the imposition of the Coercive Acts in Massachusetts. And all of the colonies are in an uproar about British power and British authority. And whether in town or city, or even out in the countryside, the Americans, farmers, laborers, artisans, and others, they rise up and they basically throw out the British authorities. On what grounds? On the grounds that parliament has no right to legislate without American representation. Conservatives put it in these words, no taxation without representation. But it mm -hmm. had not only to do yep. with taxation, it had to do with the general idea of legislation. So Payne arrives, and I can tell you that Payne is absolutely astounded, amazed, and enthralled. He falls in love with America, not only because of what he sees as incredible resources that are available, but also because Philadelphia is a city of a very diverse population, okay? It may well remind him of having been on a privateer because the privateer crews were so diverse. But here are people of diverse nationalities, diverse faiths. Um, it was essentially the capital of colonial America, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Although it's funny so to think it had a population of 30,000 
and it was one square mile. What's the population of Bemidji? Do you know? It's about the last census said it was about 13,500, but it's probably closer to 16 or 17,000 Okay, so think of a place now. twice the size of Bemidji as the capital of the North American colonies in the 1770s. <laughs> and it was only one square mile, really, in, in size. I mean, you didn't have cars. You had to walk anywhere you were going to go. And, or maybe, like St. Cloud. Yeah, like St. Cloud, where I have lived, as I think right. I told you, yep. in St. Cloud, Minnesota. So um, anyhow, but, so what we've got here is pain in America, and he's just... He cannot get over what he's witnessing, but he also can't get over the fact that these Americans have thrown out British authority and what they've done, right. essentially thrown out, and they've organized committees, committees to run their own affairs, basically. Mm -hmm. It's like an anarchist delight. Right, okay? yeah. I mean, that's really what, what it's like. So what are they calling for? They're calling for, at best, they wanna renegotiate the colonial arrangement. There is no call for independence and no call for a democratic republic. Right, so I think I, I'll just cut in here. Uh, so I think this will lead to most of most of the rest of the conversation will probably be about common sense then and, and right. how we'll that talk ties. Today, we can talk of the but, American Revolution basically. Right, but, but real quick before you get to that, just give me a real quick answer. What was Payne's thoughts on American slavery? Ah, right, I, which I almost jumped ahead of. So when he came, I mean, he really was astounded by, if you like, the freedoms that Americans were laying claim to. But from where he was living in Philadelphia, the room that he had rented, you could actually see the slave market in Philadelphia. And and he ends up writing, a, by the way, so I left out, let, let's go back to his arrival in Philadelphia. With that letter of Franklin, he not only meets Franklin's son-in-law, who was one of the most prominent figures in Philadelphia, uh, his last name was Bache, B-A-C-H-E. But he, he also is moving about the, the, the city. It's a small city, obviously. And he bookstores, coffee shops, and all of this. And while he's in one of the bookstores, the bookstore owner, who's also a print shop owner, says to him, well, what are you interested in? Because he notices Payne comes back to the shop a lot, but doesn't buy anything because Payne doesn't really have the money to do so. And when Payne started talking about his own experience and showed the man his letter of reference from Franklin, this guy was so impressed that he offered Payne the editorship of a magazine that he was launching. The, this, the guy who owned this, this print shop and bookstore. Payne becomes very quickly the editor of what is called the Pennsylvania Magazine. Okay, he does a lot of writing for the magazine of diverse sort, uh, you know, everything from probably poetry to, you know, like a farmer's almanac kind of stuff. And along the way, he also writes, though not for his own magazine, for a, a, one of the others, newspaper type things, he writes a, a, a call to end slavery. It's called African Slavery in America, because he's so horrified that a people that is so committed to the idea of liberty should permit the existence of slavery inside of the colony and the colonies. And this, this particular piece that he writes gains him some attention and a man named Benjamin Rush, who's a doctor, he's not only a young doctor, he's also a member of the Continental Congress. And he goes to see Payne because he wants to know who is this man who's got this writing talent. Little does Payne know that when he meets him, Rush and some of the others in, in the Congress are already talking about trying to, trying actually to get someone to go public with the idea of separating from Britain. Well, it's interesting that when they meet and they go for coffee a number of times, Rush says to him, you know, you ought to write a pamphlet calling for the for separating from Britain. This is in the, in the wake of Lexington and Concord of April 1775. And Payne says to him, well, why don't you write the pamphlet? You're, you're well educated. You've you've written before. And he actually said to Payne, it sounds very, very. Not just insulting, but sort of dismissive almost. He said, well, you have nothing to lose. You should write the pamphlet. <laughs> you can imagine in Payne's mind, he said, I've met people like this before, but this is a damn good idea. So between then and but that makes the a lot of sense, though, that makes so much sense that like, you know, if you're going to write a pamphlet for the revolution, the American Revolution against the and, and independence from from Britain, 
you know, what better, who better to write that than someone who has nothing to lose? Because at the, at the point that was a large part of, uh, you know, that was a large part of the. I just waved to my, somebody downstairs. My wife asked me, did you, did I got, since I got loud, she wondered <laughs> if I was calling her. So. Oh, okay. No, but. So I was it, just saying, no, it's okay. But. Yeah, but no, right. No, it, it does yeah. make sense. And in fact, over the next several months into the autumn and, and he ends up drafting and redrafting and redrafting so a pamphlet he thinks he's going to call plain truth but but i think it's rush who tells him no 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 call it common sense uh, mm -hmm. benjamin rush had trained had gotten his medical degree at the university of edinburgh in scotland and the university of edinburgh was known for a school of philosophy intellectual school called the common sense school of philosophy and i think he was trying to give pain sort of, a, 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 if you like, a better title that would gain more attention amongst readers. Mm -hmm. Well, Payne writes a pamphlet that is not only intended for people who might know anything about philosophy, it's written especially for people who knew nothing about philosophy in any formal way, for artisans and farmers and laborers, anyone who could read is who he was writing for. And for those he, who couldn't read, he probably imagined others would read it to them. So it's now January of 1776. The pamphlet is ready to go. He finds a printer. And the pamphlet, I think, first appears maybe one or 2,000 copies. And almost immediately, it sells out. OK, and what has he done? In this pamphlet, written in the clearest, clearest of English, he opens up the pamphlet without any reference to the question of independence or, 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 or you know, separating from Britain but instead opens up with the what is clearly a kind of tale of democracy. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, you have to think th that basically British government is an imposition, okay? Basically governments as we know them are an imposition. And by the way, that first part of common sense was always embraced by libertarians on the right and anarchists on the left and was also grabbed hold of by folks who just generally wanted to, you know, to, to this very day, people who oppose any kind of enhancement of government for democracy. But it actually was a call by Payne for de democratic government, as opposed to a government of kings, aristocrats, or for that matter, anyone above the ordinary people. Payne believed that ordinary people could govern themselves. That was the so, key thing, the fundamental democracy. So let's let's just have you go through uh, common sense real quick, and then you know maybe we'll do like a part two sometime to to get you know maybe like agrarian justice and hit. Oh yeah, no, absolutely, the, sure. We can go the public on. good pamphlet and stuff like that. But I know right. your your time is limited, so let's just yeah. Well, um, we've got another we've got another fifteen minutes, so we'll talk about common sense and maybe the crisis yep. papers. Okay. Yep, sweet, awesome. Okay, so common sense begins with this, this, this opening that refers to the fact that government is an imposition or a necessary evil. But, it, and, but if you read it just to that point, you completely miss what Payne is gonna tell you. Because what he goes on to tell you is that basically people are not only sociable beings, but they're almost instinctively democratic. That's his view doesn't use the word democracy. But what he says is people will turn to each other for help, okay? And at a certain time, they'll, there'll be a number of people who will find out that it's imperative that they, if you like, figure out how to get along with one another, even if they're not intimate close to one another. And they will actually gather, he, it's a great image. He says they'll gather under an oak tree, okay? As if it's in the village, you know, center, and they'll deliberate as to how to organize themselves. What kind of rules and regulations should govern behavior? People aren't saints. However, they do have these kind of democratic instincts. And then having laid out this image of democratic possibilities, which he knows is gonna resonate with Americans because remember, the rebellion is underway and Americans have already organized themselves into committees. So when he talks about this kind of instinctive democratic spirit, this is something he's hoping will be immediately sort of, it will immediately take hold in the imagination of Americans. And it does. 
So he goes on to literally lambaste British government, royalty, you know, monarchy, and the aristocracy that accompanies it. I mean, he just takes them, takes it apart. Okay, he uses the Bible, he uses history, he uses logic. Step by step, he literally deconstructs the monarchy, the idea of a monarchy. Why? Because he knows Americans have been attached to the monarchy, to the king. He's got to tear down the mythology of kings in their minds, one. Two, he then goes on to take apart the empire. Basically, he says, look, all the empire does is brings war upon us, okay? He, so he says, really, the king is a far, kings are farces, okay? Empires are dangerous, okay? We've, he's already told them democracy is possible. He then says, he then says basically that think about it this way. He holds up a mirror to them and he says, we're not even British, we're Americans, okay? And so in essence, what he's doing is he's holding up a mirror to them and saying, think, democracy, the imposition of royalty and the British government, the, the warmongering, look, Americans got, get involved in wars because the British are constantly at war with the French or the Dutch or, the, or whomever. And then he says, you know, I understand, I understand why it's so difficult for people to set, for us to separate because we don't have a plan. And then he lays out, and this is the, so now remember he's opened up with an image of democracy and democratic instincts. He then lays out the idea that he has for a constitution. And he makes it very clear that governments do not create constitutions. People, the people, create the constitution. The constitution creates the government. And he lays out this charter idea or constitutional idea and even says that the constitution should include certain freedoms, what we later will call the Bill of Rights. Okay, well, he says, what are these? Well, the protection of property and the protection of the right to free thinking, the right to conscience, the right to worship on your own terms. Now, this is important. Throughout Common Sense, Thomas Paine demands, insists on the importance of separating church and state. You know, the, the revolution to, to me was truly a revolution, despite however much too many generations people denied its really revolutionary fervor. But I could tell you, if you took everything else out of the revolutionary experience and boiled it down to just, if you could only choose one thing, okay, I would tell you that idea of separation of church and state is, was revolutionary. Because what it was not only because it was unprecedented in many ways, it's also the case, given all the diversity of faith, given the diversity of faiths in the colonies. So up in New England, you had Congregationalists, and Baptists and Presbyterians in various places in the majority. In the middle Atlantic colonies, you had um, Quakers, you had Anglicans, you had Moravians you know, from Central Europe, you had Catholics, you had Jews, you had Baptists. I mean, you just could go right on down the line, very diverse religious uh, experience in the middle Atlantic colonies. Then if you go to the South, there the Anglicans predominated, but there were growing numbers of Methodists and Baptists. And most of those folks who were Methodists and Baptists, the, if you like, they weren't so sure the revolution was even a good idea because they were convinced that the likes of Jefferson and Washington who were nominally members of the Anglican church, that basically any revolution would still leave them subordinate to the Anglican aristocracy. So, so now they read Common Sense, which says the revolution will be about separating church and state. And all of a sudden these small farmers, the Methodists, the Presbyterians and the Baptists, whose numbers were growing, they saw the revolution as liberation in, in religious terms as well, okay? So Payne was very smart. It was revolutionary both in its unprecedented character but also in the sense that it inspired a revolutionary spirit in people to enlist in the cause, okay? He then goes on, and it's very interesting, there's a great line in there. 
Um, he goes on to explain why he, he imagines the question will come up. So where's the king in America? You know, what, aren't, what about a king as part of this whole new plan? And he says, basically, he says, we don't need a king. I've, you know, basically, look, I've taken the idea of a king apart. We won't need a king. The only king that, that we would acknowledge might be God. Okay. But then he says, but here on earth, the law in America will be king. The law. Okay. And he goes on, then lays out why Americans actually can win the war if they go into a revolutionary war, which, by the way, is a very scary proposition. I mean, the British were a very powerful empire. They had the, the, the most impressive navy the world had ever seen. Okay. Tens of thousands of troops were available to them, including mercenaries from, you know, from Germany. And, you know, to the idea of launching a revolution, calling for independence and the making of a democratic republic was to some people's minds foolishness, but to many others necessary, imperative to identify the Americans as a nation, to identify the possibilities of a democratic republic. And there's a great line a few weeks after the original publication, I'll come back to that moment, but a few weeks later, Payne issues a second edition. Well, it's actually a third edition, but he issues a new edition and there's an appendix at the end, an additional section. And in there, there's a line which is in many ways to me, the most revolutionary line of modern history. And the line is this, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. Now, that's a line which is in one sense utterly untrue because we all have memories, so it wouldn't be completely new. But on the other hand, it's a full scale declaration of the fact that societies, governments, economies are created by human action. They're not derived from nature or God you know, or, or, or the divine, you might say. They're humanly created. They're socially created. It's a very revolutionary concept, which informs to whatever extent people have read him directly, but it really does inform modern thinking all the way through, maybe for better or worse, but it's a really powerful argument. Remember, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. Now, when it first appears, maybe one to 2000 copies, but it really just exploded onto the scene. I mean, it was really incredible. And it ends up selling that spring alone, probably 120,000 copies. Wow. And in the course of the revolution, maybe as much as half a million. And we should remember two things. First of all, a lot of newspapers excerpted whole sections and printed them in their, in their pages, which meant that everyone was reading this, okay? In fact, it was probably the equivalent today of 15 to 20 million copies, let's put it that way. Okay. Wow. The other thing to keep in mind is this, Payne took no royalties from it, took no money from it. He stipulated that if there are any royalties, they should go to buy mittens for Washington's troops. Yeah. Okay. And the guy was a committed revolutionary. There was just no question mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. So, okay. So it takes off. Everyone is talking about this pamphlet. Farmers are reading it out in their fields. They're reading it to each other over fences. Okay, artisans in the taverns of the major cities are getting up on tabletops and reading and quoting aloud from common sense. Everyone heard the words, even those who they probably, even those who many a, an American might not have wanted to hear, maybe black slaves were hearing it, okay? And they were figuring, okay, this is gonna be a revolution and this may be an opportunity. And I will tell you that during the revolution, the most important document of the revolution was common sense, not the declaration. It's only later that the declaration is viewed as really the truly founding document and we, and we quote from it and we imagine it. But here's the thing, if common sense had not appeared, the declaration would not have appeared either. Right. Because when common right. sense appears, town councils and, and county governments and, and, and city committees, they're sending messages suddenly to Philadelphia demanding independence. Congress is pushed because you know, the people in Congress were, they were prominent folks. 
landholders. Some bourgeois landowners, yeah. Right, middle, middle class and aristocratic type landowners. Yeah. So they have to be pushed to finally, you know, declare for revolution. And so one way of looking at it is that common sense is really the revolutionary statement. The declaration is the pronouncement to the world that the United States has come into existence. Undeniably written gotcha. with some great lines, all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I, so I, I would tell you, the next time we talk, yep. we, should launch away, we should launch from common sense. Yep. We could even start with the exchange between John Adams and Abigail Adams as a sign of just how important common sense is. Yeah, unless, you want so, to I, or unless we close on that one, possibly I could quick, I could do that. That's not urgent to get out of here. Yeah, it's up to you. And then, um, yeah. That, okay. That so works. here's what happens. Here's what happens. This is really, so John Adams in the very first week that common sense appears in Philadelphia, Adams is in Philadelphia. He's a prominent member of Congress. He buys three copies, one for himself and two, he sends up to, to Abigail in Quincy, I guess, or the Boston area, with the direction that she's supposed to give one of the copies to someone, to a friend of theirs. And John Adams is, in one sense, thrilled by common sense, because it's finally a public argument for independence. He's not so thrilled that it's so radical in its vision of America. Okay, so he sends it to Abigail, and he's waiting to hear what she thinks of it. Okay. Meanwhile, and by the way, these had to be sent by, you know, you know, these are the post in those days was slow compared to what we think of post office, even in my day. And now we've got, you know, the internet. So Abigail begins a letter and she's thrilled by the, by common sense. She's a real radical Abigail Adams. And she actually says to him in a, in a letter, she's going to send back to him. I am charmed by the sentiments. She's warmed by the sentiments, you might say. And she says, and then she says, but you men, you men should for, remember something. You're capable of real oppression. You should remember the ladies, okay? And if, and if you do not remember us, we will have to come down to Philadelphia and carry out our own revolution. Okay, well, <laughs> it's really great. Adams gets this letter from her finally. And he's, he's and once it, look, they loved each other tremendously. He's, he's clearly amused and a little unsettled, okay? Abigail thinks he might have written it, in fact. And he writes back to her, I could never have written so manly a document, basically. That's what he tells her. And he says, the man who wrote this was really good at tearing things down, but not very good at building things up, which is bullshit because Paine had already laid out a constitution. What it was is Adams was absolutely horrified by the call for democracy that was in that pamphlet, okay? In fact, it was funny, Adams, Adams had a barber who gave him shaves in Philadelphia. And he's sitting in the chair, this is a true story. So he's sitting in the chair and his barber who's giving him a shave is saying to him, He's, he's, he's literally celebrating the appearance of common sense. And he says to Adams, we're gonna to be toasting common sense tonight at the tavern. And you can imagine that Adams has got the barber's blade at his neck, probably wondering, he's not gonna slit my throat, is he? You know, something <laughs> like that. <laughs> well, anyhow, so here's the key thing. Adams writes back to Abigail and it's a very telling letter. People don't pay attention to these letters enough. And he says, not you too, in other words, not women too, we're hearing that slaves are rebelling against their masters in North Carolina, students are rebelling against their masters at the university, at the colleges, you know, Harvard, Yale, William and Mary down in, in Virginia. In other words, what he's hearing is that, all, that, not just he, but all of the members of Congress are hearing the degree to which American working people and students all around the colonies, they're rising up. They love the, the call for independence and democracy. 
And wasn't uh, was this around the same time as the Haitian Revolution? No, or Haitian Revolution later? is until 1803. This is 1776. 1803, okay. Okay. okay, so we're still before no, no, it's that. A whole, All right, whole different thing. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. uh, so there you yeah. go. So this is a pamphlet that literally is going to turn. It's not. It wouldn't be too much to say that it begins the sort of transformation, not only of American thought and action, but it begins, if you like, the modern age. Okay. Or another way of looking at it is this I do want to, I'm going to close with this. Okay. Hold on. Okay. I got to find, oh shit. Hold on. There's this great quote by, uh, by John Adams. Okay. And in years later, Adams never hesitated to make make clear how much he just didn't care for Thomas Paine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, a friend of his who was the like a professor at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia wrote to Adams and made the remark, "Aren't we living in the in an age of reason?" Okay, an age of reason. And Adams writes back and he says, "This is 1805." I am willing you should call this the age of frivolity, as you do, and would not object if you had named it the age of folly, vice, frenzy, fury, brutality, demons, Bonaparte, meaning Napoleon, Tom Paine, or the age of the burning brand from the bottomless pit, or anything but the age of reason. I know not whether any man in the world has had more influence on its inhabitants or affairs for the last 30 years than Thomas Paine. Mm. And then he says this, you can tell how much he despises Paine, the revolutionary small d Democrat. There can be no more severe satire on the age for such a mongrel between pigs and puppy begotten by a wild boar on a bitch wolf never before in any age of the world was suffered by the poltroonery of mankind to run through such a career of mischief. Call it then, the age of pain. Who is that? John Adams on Thomas John Payne. Adams. Yeah, which was to show you that even Adams, it killed him to say it in some ways. Adams was always worried he'd be forgotten in history. Here he is acknowledging the most important figure from the 1770s to 1800 was Thomas Paine. And it kills him to say it. Why? Because Paine is this revolutionary Democrat. And we can pick it up next time mm -hmm. sounds like uh sounds like john adams would have been great as a twitter president um speaking yeah, of that oh by one i always i will twitter. tell you this i will tell you this if i had to choose one of the major founding fathers to spend some time with it might actually be after thomas Paine. that is right right of it course. might be adams because adams was so unlike all the other founders he never hesitated to tell you exactly what was on his mind it was like he was constantly talking to a therapist when he wrote. Okay. <laughs> I, oh boy, I could just imagine a, a Donald Trump, uh, John Adams, like, I don't like Thomas Paine. He's not good. He's not great. Um, but uh, so your Twitter, do you want to plug your Twitter real quick and then get out of here? Oh, plug my Twitter. It's Twitter. at Harvey JK. If anyone mm -hmm. is really interested in Thomas Paine, the book that I was pointing to before, Thomas Paine and the Promise of America. And I will tell you, it's not the life of Thomas Paine alone. The book is the life and labors of Thomas Paine and how, how they have been present in a fashion all the way through American history. Because now I'm going to give you the punchline, which is right at the opening of the book. Thomas Paine turned Americans into radicals in 1776. And in many ways, we remain radicals at heart ever since. There you go. Amazing. And if you want to check out one of Harvey's other books, uh, this is a book about FDR and the Four Freedoms. So go check that out. Um, thank you. You are our best resource for American history. So thank you very much. Uh, a lot of people are thank liking you, it. So uh, yeah, I'll see you later. We'll see you soon. Take care.